Hello, my friends. Welcome to week 12 of season five of Be Formed. Uh, we're going to be talking about holy matrimony and the church fathers uh, this week. So let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the gift of our lives, the gift of love, the gift of marriage, and the vocation that you've called each one of us to. We lift up to you all those who are married, especially those that are struggling. We lift up to you, each one of us, that are trying to strive for holiness in our vocation. Help us to glorify you in all that we say and do. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week, we talked about the sacrament of holy matrimony and the catechism of the Catholic Church. Today, we'll look at the Church Fathers. Again, we've talked about these uh, last two sacraments, matrimony and holy orders, which will be next week. Uh, are, they're called the sacraments of vocation, the sacraments of commitment, or the sacraments of mission in the Church. So let's look at some of the Church Fathers. And we talked la last week, the main thing I want you to remember about marriage is consent makes the marriage. Consent between uh, two people, a man and a woman, a valid consent, using the form where they have a, a church minister witnessing and there are no impediments to the marriage. The ministers of, of holy matrimony are the, the couple and the priest or deacon or bishop is the witness to that marriage. And so this comes right from scripture where Jesus says, you know, the two shall become one, one flesh and what God has joined, man must not put asunder. Man must not divide. And so we have to take Jesus' words seriously uh, while at the sa same time being a pastoral when difficult things happen. So uh, if we look at Adam and Eve, you know, we know that there was, there was marriage from the very beginning. Um, and to this day, the church has valued marriage. The church values marriage as something sacred. So... A valid marriage bond between two people cannot just be dissolved. And so uh, Jesus says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another does what? Commits adultery, which we know is uh, a serious or mortal sin, which we're going to be talking about next season. What is mortal sin? And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So it's on both sides. If, if any married person is married validly before God, uh, they cannot uh, get married otherwise. St. Paul was equally insistent on this. He said in Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, Thus a married woman is bound by law to her living husband. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law in respect to her husband. So death ends that marriage bond, and someone can freely contract marriage again after the death of a spouse. Consequently, while her husband is alive, she will be called an adulteress if she consorts with another man. So that's from St. Paul. So we have the words of Jesus. We have the words of St. Paul holding up the sacredness of marriage and the indissolubility of a valid marriage bond. This applies, uh, of course, only to sacramental marriages. So those between uh, baptized people for marriages involving an unbaptized party, a different rule is applied. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 to 15, uh, it includes this. If the unbeliever separates, so if, 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 if a married person is married to an unbeliever, uh, it says, let them separate. This is St. Paul. The brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to peace. And so there, there is a clause that if, um, if a Catholic is married to, a non -Catholic, to an unbaptized person, um, and because of those religious differences, it, it just doesn't work, then that is, um, that's grounds for a de declaration of a, a nullity of marriage where that marriage bond um, is not valid. In the Greco-Roman culture, they allowed easy divorce and remarriage. So the early church fathers proclaimed Christ's teaching on the indissolubility of marriage. So much like today when, when divorce is very common in our society, uh, the church is probably the one voice that's saying this is not according to, to God's ways. Um, and so 
the church is standing uh, behind the words of Jesus saying this is sac a sacred marriage bond. Um, unfortunately, other Christian denominations have kind of modified uh, their teachings to, to accommodate the pro-divorce ethos that dominates our modern culture. But the Catholic Church preserves the teachings of Jesus and the early Christians. While their ex-spouses are alive, the only time that a baptized couple can remarry after divorce is when the valid sacramental marriage never existed in the first place. And that's what the process of a, a declaration of nullity or an annulment does. Um, so if a competent authority, and that's usually the diocesan tribunal, which is an office with canon lawyers, they determine that consent was not valid. And we're going to talk, I'll talk about toward the end, uh, some of the common reasons for a declaration of nullity um, that can be granted, which would allow the person to be able to remarry uh, in the church. Uh, in this case, when there is a declaration of nullity, there's no, div there's no divorce uh, in, in God's eyes because there was no marriage before God in the first place. So again, this doesn't mean that the, the legal marriage didn't exist and therefore any children are legitimate. It just says that there was not a valid uh, sacramental bond that was formed. So if, however, the parties are genuinely and sacramentally married, a valid marriage, then while in some cases there may be good reasons for them to live apart or even obtain a legal separation, in God's eyes, they're not free to marry. So we always look at the view not from the legal perspective, but from God's eyes. When two people validly marry before God, whether they get a, a civil divorce, whether they're separated, a legal separation, they're still married in God's eyes and they're not free to marry again. This is not a commandment of man. This is not something that we just made up. Again, it's based on the words uh, of the Lord and of, of St. Paul as well. Fortunately, God will ensure that the sacramentally married have the same grace, have the grace necessary to live out their marriage. So we, we talked about sacramental grace, uh, and that's why it's so important that, that people get married in the church. Marriage is hard enough as it is, but that sacramental grace is so important. So the sacrament of matrimony itself gives the grace. Whenever we face trials uh, in marriage, it's God's grace that's going to help us get through. St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So again, St. Paul is talking about God gets, gives us the grace in order to get through any situation, including uh, difficult marriage situations. So some of the church fathers on this indissolubility of marriage. Uh, Hermas in 80 AD, so late first century, he says this, What then shall the husband do if the wife continue in this disposition of adultery? Let him divorce her and let the husband remain single. But if he divorce his wife and marry another, he too commits adultery. So somebody who's married validly, gets a divorce and remarries, commits adultery. Um, even in the case where where somebody commits adultery in the first marriage, it doesn't mean that just gives you free reign to marry again. A tribunal might find that maybe the marriage was not valid in the first place, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Justin Martyr, one of my favorites because his feast day is June 1st, which is my, the anniversary of my ordination. He said this in 151 A.D., Whoever marries a woman who has been divorced from another husband commits adultery. According to our teacher, meaning Jesus, just as they are sinners who contract the second marriage, even though it be in accord with human law. So even though human law allows somebody to divorce and remarry, so also they are, they, are they sinners who look with lustful desire at a woman. So Jesus says that anyone who looks at a woman with lust is committing adultery. Um, and also anybody who who divorces and remarries without the declaration of, a null, of nullity uh, is committing adultery also. So divine law uh, is, is greater than human law. And one more I'll look at because I looked at many of the church fathers and they were all saying the same thing. So I'm just going to give you three 
that talk about the same idea of how important and indissoluble the marriage bond is. Origen in 248 AD, he says this, just as a woman is an adulteress, even though she seemed to be married to a man, while a former husband yet lives, so somebody who divorces while their first spouse is living, so also the man who seems to marry her who has been divorced does not marry her, but according to the declaration of our Savior, he commits adultery with her. So again, if we're looking at this from God's eyes, you're still married to your first spouse until the church, which is the authority in this case, says that the, your first marriage was not a valid sacramental marriage, the declaration of, a null, of nullity. Some questions that have come up this week around marriage, uh, three questions that I want to answer uh, that I think might help along with this, looking at the church fathers and the indissolubility of, of the, the marriage bond. Cohabitation. As, as you can probably tell just by anecdotes, the, the percentage of people who are cohabitating, living together before marriage has skyrocketed. Many people do it because, you know, they'll use crude terms like, you know, you, you test drive a car in order to buy a car. Wouldn't you do this in marriage? I'm like, no, your, your future spouse is not a car. Um, so what uh, the experts have found in, in studying cohabitation and divorce rates, interesting. It's the opposite of what you think. It's, most people think, oh, this will help you find your marriage partner and it'll lead to not, it will not lead to divorce. What they found is the first year of marriage for couples who cohabitate, the percentage of divorce goes down because they've probably worked through some of those early things. But after the first year, couples who cohabitate and live together are 30% more likely to divorce after that first year. So I, I share this because it's so common today uh, among young people. In, in fact, I've talked with people who feel pressure from their friends that they why would you not cohabitate? And it's because they don't, they don't know these studies and they don't understand divine law that God created us and, and our, our sexuality for the sacredness of the marriage bond, for that committed uh, uh, union of marriage. And whenever our sexuality is used outside of, outside of marriage, uh, valid marriage, then it's being used in the wrong way. And there's all kinds of consequences to that. And so again, next season I think is going to be very interesting because we're going to talk a lot about, um, about sin, freedom, virtue, and, uh, and you know, living a moral Christian life, which actually morality is what leads, part of what leads to true happiness. Another question that came up, can we have our wedding someplace other than the church building? So there's a lot of destination weddings. <clears throat> a lot of people who don't want to get married in the church. This is what the church says. In most cases, Catholics are required to be married in a church building, according to Canon, canon Law number 1118. There are some exceptions, and these are very few and very rare, and it would have to be the permission of the bishop. Uh, when a Catholic marries someone who is not Catholic, the Catholic party may request permission from the local bishop to celebrate the wedding at the other person's place of worship. So again, this is in a church. So let's say a Catholic is marrying a Lutheran. Uh, if for some reason, uh, if for the reason that the Lutheran's faith is very strong and they want to get married in the Lutheran church, they can get dispensation from... Catholics are required to get married in the Catholic church. And if they don't get dispensation, it's not a valid marriage in the church's eye. So there is time. There are times when a Catholic can get married in another non-Catholic church. This is a church with permission of the bishop. Um, church law states that the wedding may be held in some other suitable place, which is in quotes, besides the Catholic church. So it's technically possible that they could get married outside, but it's very rare, and very few bishops will allow this because uh, we believe that the sacredness of like baptisms, uh, weddings, funerals should be held in a, in a church building, which is, you know, the house of God. There are uh, masses, like for example, I'm the Cubs chaplain. I celebrate mass at Wrigley Field, but it's with the permission of the Archbishop of Chicago. And so 
For example, if somebody wanted to celebrate a, a, an outdoor mass here in my parish, uh, they would have to get my permission to do that. So it's, it can be permissible to have an outside mass, but it, it's, it's recommended and the proper place for masses are in the church, uh, but only for uh, certain occasions. So it, it's, it goes on to say, no one would argue against the beauty of nature. And, you know, after all, creation reveals the presence of the Creator in a powerful way. But Catholics remember that Jesus Christ promised to continue to be present whenever his friends gathered in his name. And the church building is the house in which is the followers of Jesus do this on a regular basis. Um, so for Catholics, it makes sense to begin a new household in the sacred house of God. And so... Um, any, any mass outside of the church building needs to have the permission of the, the local bishop uh, and or the local pastor. And then finally, a question about annulments. This was a big question that came in this week. A marriage may be found to be invalid if the basic requirements of a valid marriage do not exist at the time of the wedding. So the marriage tribunal might uh, make a declare, declaration of nullity if, the fo if one of the following cases um, are valid. If a legal impediment to marriage existed at the time of the wedding, so for example, age, and now the Pope has made the age, the minimum age for men and women is 16. Um, so if somebody was under age 16, that would be an impediment to marriage. And if there was not dispensation, it would not be a valid marriage. If full and free consent to marriage was lacking on the part of one of the spouses at the time of the wedding. And we'll talk about some of those uh, cases. And if the wedding did not follow the canonical form, that is the church's law governing how marriage is to take place, it could also be rendered uh, invalid. So according to Father Joseph Champlin, the most common reasons for declaring a marriage uh, invalid are insufficiency or inadequacy of judgment, also known as lack of due discretion, due to some factors such as young age, so people getting married too young, uh, or pressure to get married in haste. So for example, if someone is pregnant and they feel the, the pressure to get married, that might uh, impair their, their full consent to freely get married. Psychological incapacity, so that would be something they would look at uh, at the time of marriage. And the absence of a proper intention to have children so there have been cases where somebody will tell their spouse they want to have children, but as soon as they get married, they say, I'm not having children. And of course, we believe that one of the goals of marriage is, is procreation, the, the openness to life. Uh, not every couple is able to have children, um, but to ha have that openness to life. Or the, uh, the intention to remain together for life. So if there isn't the intention to, to marry this person for life, uh, that could be an invalid marriage as well. So that's, those are some of the questions that I received this week on marriage. Again, the Alexio Divina this week we want you to, to look at is, is, is the same as last week. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. talks about the uh, Jesus' words on the, the permanence of marriage, the, the beauty of marriage. And so spend time with that. And while you're doing that, pray for Pray for marriage. Pray for those who are struggling. Pray for those who uh, are having difficult times. And in my work with uh, Be Healed, I realize you know, how difficult marriage is because two people are bringing their wounds from the past together and all of the stuff that comes with their woundedness. And they're trying to live this, this lifetime commitment together. That's why healing is, is so powerful and can lead couples to, to find ways to, and with God's grace, of course, uh, to find ways to live this beautiful sacrament out. Uh, announcements before our closing prayer. Once again, our next large group is December 15th, uh, not the 5th or the 9th, December 15th. So it'll be a week after our season ends on December 8th. And uh, that'll be here at St. Isaac's at 6.30. We'll have a little reception afterward to celebrate uh, Season 5 of Be Formed. And if you'd like to bring an appetizer, something to share, that would be appreciated as well. Next week, we're going to hear about holy orders. And because 
Uh, we only have one week to cover Holy Orders. We're going to cover the Catechism and the Church Fathers together around this beautiful sacrament that deacons, priests, and bishops share. And then uh, next season again, starting January 10th through April 9th, we're going to be talking about Book 3, or Part 3 of the Catechism, Our Life in Christ, Morality, Freedom, Virtue. I think it's going to be a, a great season. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you and praise you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for giving us the grace to live out our vocation. Help us to rely on you for all that we have and all that we are. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone. Uh, please uh, check in with your prayer partners uh, each day this week. and. Hopefully your small groups uh, have formed this great bond and I'm hearing some incredible stories and anecdotes from your small groups. So it makes my heart, uh, it warms my heart to hear uh, how Be Formed is, is helping you on your journey to Christ. God bless you.